On this week's edition of New York Now, Governor Andrew Cuomo delivers his 10th State of the State address. We'll have details. We will win the COVID war and we will learn and grow from the experience. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and Jimmy Bielkind from The Wall Street Journal are in studio with analysis of Cuomo's remarks and the news of the week. Then, Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie joins us with a reaction and what Democrats in the Assembly have planned for this year's legislative session. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a pass a law prohibiting it. And we will take them to court challenging it. stand for New York and sending a message to Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Governor Cuomo's State of the State Address is usually a huge event. It's a real who's who of state politics. And it's a lot like the president's State of the Union. Cuomo uses it to tell lawmakers what he wants to do that year. And then they hash it out behind closed doors. But this year was different. Cuomo delivered his 10th State of the State Address virtually this week from the state capitol. And he tried to use this year's speech as a plan forward in a post-COVID economy. Take a look. For Governor Andrew Cuomo, the COVID-19 pandemic is a war, and New York is winning. We will win the COVID war, and we will learn and grow from the experience. That was his message as he delivered his 10th State of the State address in Albany this week. It was divided into four speeches over four days, and the focus of Cuomo's remarks centered on two major themes, the COVID-19 pandemic and New York's struggling economy. covid has been costly in every sense of the word. Cuomo pledged a strategy to curb the pandemic in New York, including a wider distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. Cuomo blamed the federal government for the vaccine's rocky rollout in New York, saying the state isn't getting enough doses. I believe the new federal administration will see the vaccine supply increase, and we will be ready for that increase. But Cuomo also called for balance between the COVID-19 pandemic and the state's economy. New York can't afford to stay closed, he said, while the virus continues to spread. The truth is, we cannot stay closed until everyone is vaccinated. The economic, psychological, emotional cost would be incredible. New York is already facing a budget deficit of about $15 billion heading into this year. That's according to the state. And there are a lot of different ideas on how to fill that gap. Cuomo has said for months that he expects the incoming Biden administration to include aid for New York in a new stimulus package. And that was still his position this week. With our new president, a new Senate, and the House members, I believe they will do justice. But Democrats in the legislature don't feel the same way. They're also hoping for aid from Washington, but they're seriously considering tax hikes on the wealthy as well to help fill the state's budget gap. Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins said this week those conversations are ongoing. So, yeah, we're, we're more than willing to look at uh, taxing millionaires and billionaires because, again, we need to rebuild our economy. We can't just wait for Washington. Cuomo's claimed that tax hikes on the wealthy wouldn't generate enough revenue to fill the state's budget gap, a claim that some have disputed. But Republicans in the state legislature are actually on board with Cuomo on that point, and they're worried the rich could leave New York if they're hit with higher taxes. Here's Senate Republican leader Rob Ort. When you want people investing here, you want people coming to New York, you want pe- these folks hiring folks, there's a potential this could have the reverse effect. And speaking of jobs, Cuomo's also throwing his support behind marijuana legalization in New York for a third year. That won't be easy. Democrats in the legislature are still divided on how exactly the drug should be legalized. This will raise revenue and will end the overcriminalization of this product that has left so many communities of color over police and over incarcerated. Cuomo is also pushing lawmakers to greenlight mobile sports betting, which would allow users to make bets from their phone. That's something Cuomo previously thought was unconstitutional. Democrats said his new position could change how they look at the issue. This is new that the uh, that the governor is, is willing to take a look at that. So, I mean, you know, I'm sure we will be able to continue our discussions and, and hopefully get to to a good end. In the meantime, Cuomo's proposing a series of new initiatives to make New York more affordable and bolster the state's economy. For one, he wants to cap the price of high-speed internet at $15 per month for low-income families. That idea was inspired by the COVID-19 pandemic, which forced many New Yorkers to work and learn online. 
A remote economy requires high-speed internet for all. We need to ensure a level playing field. No one can be left behind. Both Republicans and Democrats in the state legislature plan to make high-speed internet a top issue this year. Ort said he'll wait for details on Cuomo's proposal, but that the state must do more to expand both the affordability and access to broadband. I still in, uh, see and hear from many New Yorkers across the state that simply do not, do not have access, let alone affordability, they don't have access. Looking ahead, Cuomo says he also wants the state to invest in a new green energy plan geared at boosting sustainable energy and development. To start, he says New York will launch a $26 billion partnership with private companies to build nearly 100 renewable projects. These projects will not only create power, but bring needed economic opportunity to struggling parts of our state. And to top off his economic plan, Cuomo says he wants to invest $306 billion over several years in public infrastructure projects, like train stations and new highway renovations. That will help jumpstart the economy, he said, after the state lost thousands of jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's not just the largest infrastructure plan in New York history. It's the largest, most ambitious plan of any state in the nation. The big question is whether Cuomo can do everything he wants this year while balancing the state's finances. And that's a question he's expected to answer next week when he'll release his plan for the state budget, which is due at the end of March. And we're hoping to take Cuomo's budget address live here on PBS next week. Stay tuned for details on that. But let's bring in our panel for the week for analysis. Jimmy Vielkind is a reporter with The Wall Street Journal, and Karen DeWitt is from New York State Public Radio. Thank you both for being here. Sure Thanks thing. So it was a very fun week with four states <laughs> of the state, four addresses. Let's start wide and then narrow in. Karen, what were your big takeaways? This was long expected speech that we were hoping to focus on the budget. Yeah, fun, fun and exhausting, I think, because yeah. it was many, many days that we had to to cover. Um, one thing, I, I guess I would say off the top, I thought that the governor doing it in the war room it actually looked visually really nice. It was beautiful. Yeah. I really liked that. Yeah, and I actually think in a way it was better without all of the um, applause because it just, he kind of connected with people a little bit. That said, it seemed like it was four days of good news. He highlighted all the programs that he wants to do all in preparation for coming up next week when there's going to be one day of very bad news, which is the state budget and the deficit. And I don't think there's any way you can spin that into good news. And I think he knows that. And having four days where he could control the stage and kind of, you know, highlight what he wanted to, I think that really worked well for the governor, honestly. Although he did get some good news on Thursday evening. President-elect Joe Biden came out with a sort of stimulus package, and he said that it's going to include aid for state and local governments. We don't know how much, but that may be some help for the governor. Jimmy, what were your takeaways from the State of the State? I, I agree with Karen, and I, I did think that it was striking the way the speech was sort of more narrowly tailored. They were shorter than his normal speeches, and thank you. Uh, they were, <laughs> I think it was great. And, and that goes to your point that this mm. was not the normal sort of um, celebration or homecoming for state government that the state of the state often is, where people from around the state, mayors, et cetera, mm -hmm. come into Albany, they, they have a nice lunch, they see everybody, oh, ho, ho, you know, and, and it really did allow the general public to engage more. I was struck by, I, I think he has a very pretty narrow focus in what he's doing, which is um, I, we need to rebound from the pandemic. Uh, there are calls for the governor to perhaps enact big, bold, progressive policies. Uh, there are calls for him to raise taxes and make massive increases in social programs and spending. He made clear, at least to my ears, that he's not going to go that direction. Uh, but at the same time, we saw some of the same Cuomo tropes from the last 10 years, uh, namely sort of talking about what has already been accomplished, uh, you know, sort of packaging and rolling together things that are already in motion with the news so that you get these big, big numbers of promises. But I, I thought that my big takeaway was that he, he clearly is, is very mission driven about the coronavirus. And, and I don't think he's gonna spend a lot of time and oxygen on, on other things. Well, yeah, I, I don't see how you can in a year like this. I mean, that is what people really want him to do. 
And so far he's doing it with mixed results, as I think we'll be discussing a little bit later in the show. Right. In years past, the governor's state of the state is almost overwhelming to us reporters. We're in the room. We typically get these books that people don't really know about, but we get these books yeah. full of all of his proposals. And it's yes. almost tough to take that hour and focus in on what's going to be the big story. The big story this year, as we've said, is obviously... And then obviously... running around and getting reaction. Yeah, well. exactly. I have to say that part I do miss. The interaction, as Jimmy was mentioning, that cel celebratory part was missing of it, where you get to see everybody again in person and talk to them in a crowded room. Exactly. Imagine. <laughs> and in the next few weeks, the, the lawmakers that we would be getting reaction from are going to be focusing on starting state budget negotiations. The governor has said that uh, we have a $15 billion budget deficit. Jimmy, you've tried to explain to me before that we may not have a $15 billion budget deficit. What is the deal? So the $15 million <clears throat> is not really a deficit. It's the amount of revenue that the state has lost from its sort of peak projections before the pandemic hit. So it's really a shortfall is the best word for it. The actual stated projected deficit is $8.7 billion for next year's budget. Uh, but this year's budget is balanced with uh, a big asterisk in it. It's sort of an $8 billion hole. So there's a lot of discussion and uh, some disagreement among fiscal uh, experts and watchdogs. Uh, the state comptroller, Tom DiNapoli, says that tax collections have actually been better than expected and better than the governor's projections, which were released at the end of October, say. That's good so uh, it's a little bit less. There's $4 billion for schools that was included in the December stimulus package approved by the federal government. We don't know how that's going to play in financially. But I think for next year, you're looking at something um, around $10 billion and again, as you said, Dan, there is the likelihood, possibility, take your pick, of more federal aid coming. And unlike previous stimulus packages that we've seen since the onset of this pandemic, it's possible that with all Democrats in control of the federal government, they will just cut a check to New York and have unrestricted state and local aid. Whereas to this point, the stimulus funding that has come New York's way has been sort of uh, diverted through schools, through enhanced uh, FMAP, which is Medicaid funding, and other pots. I don't think we could totally rely, though, on the federal government just bailing New York out. I, mean, I don't know if they can really give the whole $8 billion. I think there's going to be pressure to do some things. And the governor's already mentioned legalizing the adult use of recreational marijuana, um, expanding sports betting, which you wrote a very interesting article about the complexities of, of doing the sports betting, and, you know, taxing the rich. I think the governor's under a lot of pressure. The progressives and the legislature, they want to do this before the pandemic. And now they have a super majority, a veto-proof majority. So I think the governor's going to be under a lot of pressure to raise income taxes on, as the uh, progressive advocates say, the 118 billionaires that they've counted in, in New York, as well as multimillionaires. And, so and remember, the last time New York raised taxes was in 2009, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, in sort of as unemployment was spiking. So, Karen, you're absolutely right. There is a lot of political pressure. There's a pretty decent fiscal case to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have as a variable is that every signal that the governor has sent is that he is very loath to do this. Yeah, and we'll and see how that plays out. And he's worried that wealthy people are going to leave the state. And some of them did. In the last recession that you mentioned, Tom Golisano, a big name in upstate New York, changed his residence, I think, to Florida so that he didn't have to pay the taxes. And uh, I mean, the argument goes that all you need is just a a few billionaires to leave, and that's a lot of money that, that you know, you're not going to get in taxes. Before we run out of time, we have a few minutes left. I want to touch on some other things. We may have buried the lead. The president was impeached this week. And <laughs> oh, right. Again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Republicans in Congress from New York, uh, I believe uh, all of them voted except for CatCo against impeachment. So CatCo from the Syrac Syracuse area voted uh, against impeachment for impeachment. Right. Um, Karen, what's going on here? Elise Stefanik is still sticking by the president after the events of January 6th. I don't know if it works for her politically. Her district is certainly a Trump district, but has she said anything? Well, if you remember a long, long time ago, the last impeachment about a year ago, she decided to stick with Trump and he kind of made her a star in the Republican Party. So I think she's kind of stuck right now. She was would, his champion at the time. Yes, it would look very hypocritical if suddenly now she said, you know, I'm not sticking with him. But she is getting some blowback, although she won re-election by a pretty healthy margin. I guess she feels like her, that's her base and she doesn't want to offend them.
Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see in the next few years as redistricting happens, if that district becomes even a little bit more blue, and then maybe she'll have more of a challenge in two years. That's that a very good point. Might blow back on her. But again, that district as it is right now, she's pretty safe with but her with, position. But with Democrats in charge of the legislature, yeah, that's a very good point. That, yeah. they, that they may, you know, cut away some of her some of her support. But I think at this point she's in too, too deep. Yeah, I think so too. Right. I think that if yeah. she went back, I think it would look very hypocritical for yeah. her. But, you know, politicians never surprise any of us. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. Um, the vaccine rollout, I want to touch on, we have to touch on this before <sighs> we go. The vaccine rollout this week has been messy. I think that everybody can agree with that. The Cuomo administration is defending it, saying the federal government is only sending the state 300,000 doses a week. Jimmy, what's going on here? Is it the federal government? Is it the state? Is it a mix of the two? Well, this week marked a big change from New York because previously the governor had set very strict eligibility criteria. He was uh, reluctant to let county leaders and uh, public health officials on the local level take an active role in distributing the vaccine as they expected to do. And then as of Monday, he sort of said, okay, we're going into tranche 1B. We're expanding the universe of people who are eligible by about fourfold. Uh, and then the federal government increased that even further when it said New Yorkers over 65 can get the vaccine. So now what we have is a massive distribution network and a very limited supply. Uh, and we're, going, we're starting to see competition among the distribution points, be they the state-run sites at places like the Javits Center, be they your local doctor's office or your local hospital system. And the result for New Yorkers is confusion. Because do I call my doctor? Do I call the state hotline? Do I have to go on this website? The website is crashing. Yeah. The hotline is cracking down. Right. Especially for people who are perhaps older and less computer savvy, uh, this has caused problems already. And I think that it's going to continue to do so for the next few days and weeks. And even the computer savvy older people spending hours you know, the website crashing repeatedly. Now all the state sites that are open, they're booked through April. In the hotline, you're on the, the line for hours, I and mean, people are extremely, extremely frustrated. And I think that there's going to be blowback for um, the state. I think so, Cuomo too. State leaders. It's frustrating for everybody. You're just trying to get this life-saving vaccine, yeah, and exactly. there's just no avenue for it for three months, four months? Who knows? Uh, yeah. I guess we'll, we'll see. It's discouraging news. It yeah. very, really is. Exactly. Uh, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, Jimmy Vielkind from The Wall Street Journal. Thank you both. So with Cuomo's state of the state now over, Democrats in the state legislature are starting to form their own agenda for the year. But like Cuomo, a lot of it depends on the state's budget gap and whether Congress comes through with a new stimulus package. I spoke this week with Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty about the state's budget deficit and what Democrats have planned for the year. Assembly Speaker Hasty, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Anytime. So we're talking on Tuesday, which means that as we're talking, the governor has two more state of the states to do by Thursday. Tell me your reaction to what he said so far in his state of the state addresses. I think the governor's message so far is going to be one of really um, uh, survival and, revi uh, and, and, um, and revival, uh, trying to make sure that uh, people are safe. Uh, but we have to get this state moving back. How do we get, uh, you know, access to uh, um, to uh, broadband for for students, for businesses? I think it's all part of a, a message of, uh, of um, survival and revival um, while we continue to fight this pandemic. So we've heard from the governor about his top priorities this week. Tell me about the top priorities in the assembly this year as Democrats continue to stay in the majority. Obviously, you have a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it. Tell me what's at the top of your list. Well, we always uh, say that our agenda is always a family's first agenda. Uh, as I outlined in my opening comments last year, we're very concerned about the health disparities. Uh, we're very concerned that uh, uh, there's still billions of dollars in rental arrears. Uh, renters are hurting, small landlords are hurting. Um, so we just want uh, people need childcare. We wanna make sure people are vaccinated and we wanna make sure that the economy um, is able to, uh, um, I'd say, rebound. And then also, uh, we want the federal government to uh, to step up because there's so so many things, uh, you know, I feel as a national pandemic, it is the federal government's responsibility. I, I am hopeful uh, with uh, President Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and uh, Speaker Pelosi and our own senior Senator Chuck Schumer being the majority leader that, uh, 
a lot of the things that we were hoping to happen that didn't happen or were slow to happen, I think we'll see more um, more action uh, coming from uh, this administration and this and and this Congress. Last month, you were in Albany, and you mentioned to reporters that you would really like to see some tax raises on the wealthy to help fill the state's budget gap. At the time, the governor was against that. He really pushed back on it, and he seems to be continuing that theme this year. Can you give us an update on how negotiations stand on some potential tax hikes on the wealthy? Well, we haven't negotiated anything. Again, you know, my only concern, uh, and you know, perhaps the governor could be right, uh, was I was concerned about uh, retroactivity of taxes, and that was the main reason. Um, but I guess I was kind of just, uh, excuse the pun, hedging my bets uh, about making sure that there's re uh, there were the potential to have revenue, and I just felt more secure that if we had done the, uh, a tax increase beforehand. Now, that being said, um, we're still going to keep these options on the table. Uh, but I am expecting uh, that the, the, you know, the Biden administration, uh, along with our senior senator, will produce uh, for us. I have faith that they will do that. Do you think even if they come through with that aid for New York, that you'll still push for tax increases on the wealthy? Of course, the federal government may not provide enough to fill our budget gap. I think this is, goes back, uh, Dan, you know I'm a financial person. I think uh, supply will have to meet demand. And I think if the federal government doesn't give us enough supply for our demand, then that's when I think that we will have to uh, really start to look at uh, uh, the different revenue raises. I really think it's a supply and demand question. There are two revenue raisers that are on the table in the news this week and last week, marijuana legalization and online sports betting. I know the assembly is in favor of marijuana legalization. There's some different uh, differences to work out between the Senate assembly and the governor's version of the bill. Uh, where do you see that conversation going? Do you see marijuana being legalized in New York this year? Um, I, I see there's the, the possibility. I think, uh, you know, it is a, a you know, a, <clears throat> a revenue raiser. Uh, but one of the areas of concern that uh, I'd say steering the discussion is we want to make sure that the communities that were heavily impacted from the um, the criminalization of marijuana, we want to make sure that those communities are, are, are made whole um, and not just have this as a total revenue raiser for the state of New York. Uh, so I think that there needs to be some uh, kind of a set aside for those communities that were affected uh, people who went to jail for marijuana. All of those things we need, feel need to be uh, need to be rectified. And on uh, uh, you know sports betting, uh, you know again it's one of the options uh, that that's on the table. Do you think there's anything non-budget related that you'd like to see accomplished this year? Obviously, I think everything is centering around the budget for an obvious reason. We have the huge deficit. But if you took that off the table, are there any other issues that you're really looking forward to in these next few months? I mean, there's still, you know, probably more policy issues that we want, you know, probably still need to uh, to look at, uh, you know, be uh, depending on where, you know, where the world is. Uh, I, I always think uh, um, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, police and community reforms, uh, you know, always uh, um, uh, something for us to uh, uh, to look at. But I would say other criminal justice uh, reform issues. Uh, but most things right now, particularly through this pandemic, are really tied to the budget. Uh, I'd say 95% of, I'd say, the, the major issues right now, whether it's having uh, people having access to childcare, uh, getting people back to work, businesses having to deal with the uh, higher uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance premiums, that I'm hoping that the federal government will take that burden off of us as well, or having the state to pay it back. So I'd say, most of the things right now are, are very, uh, I'd say, uh, money-driven, but there's always the ability for us to deal uh, with, with policy changes. You know, there's a lot of new members of the Assembly, and some of them primaried uh, some veteran members, and they're considered to be more to the left than the members that you had in last year. You've had a few conferences with your members. How do you think the, the ideology of the conference has changed? Do you see it influencing your different priorities for the year? Well, I, I would just say this. I, I don't know if the new members were more to the, uh, I'd say more to the left than the other members because, um, you know, in the last five years, we've done some magnificent, magnificent progressive uh, items. Um, but as I, as I like to say, I always like to give sports analogies. 
um, that uh, the players may change, but the assembly's game plan always remains the same. But the, the new members are energetic, they are engaged, they're excited uh, to get to work. Um, you know, coming in at a, at a challenging time uh, allows you to, uh, to, you know, to raise your level of, uh, of uh, service and ability to problem solve. So I'm excited to have the, uh, the new members. Uh, they're bringing great energy. They're all coming in as, as wonderful parts of the team. Uh, everybody understands they're you know they're one voice of 107, and they've been excellent uh, uh, members and excellent members of part of the team. I think their new energy is going to be great. I think the excitement of wanting to help us get out of this challenge is uh, is, a, is a wonderful thing. All right. Well, we will be watching to see what the federal government comes through with once the new administration is in place. Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Stay safe. We'll have more details on the state budget on next week's show, and we'll also hear from freshman Senator Mike Martucci, one of only two Republicans, to flip a seat from Democrats last year. But until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET and by the Dominic Ferrioli Foundation.